Hey everybody, in today's model building workshop I'm going to do a brief discussion about Japanese tanks. Now I'm a big fan of building Japanese tanks because I think they're really fascinating to, to look at. Uh, they're fun to paint. Uh, there's quite a few out there um, that are kind of just interesting looking. They almost look like science fiction vehicles but these actually existed and they were used throughout the 1930s and through World War II. This one here is a pretty easy to find Japanese uh, Type 97 Chiha tank and this was basically their main tank throughout the 1930s and uh, World War II. So, so here it is. This is by the model company Tamiya. And this is not a difficult model to build so kids that have patience <laughs> Could probably do this a little help from an adult but this isn't too bad to do and it's a lot of fun and uh, another manufacturer that's does a lot of Japanese tank models but these are kind of harder to come by uh, I recommend searching the internet for these is the uh, fine moles out of Japan and this is the uh, type 2 Ho E and they're a little more expensive than the Tamiya kits but if you're really into this stuff, like I am, th these are great. They're also very easy to build, and I, I find these tremendously fun to do. Uh, but I like the odd subject matter. Not everybody's like me and likes the weird stuff that I like. So I'm kind of known for that in the model building shops and whatnot, that the weirder it is, the more I'm interested in it. So, but that's me. <laughs> and I guess it's probably not a surprise to most of you. So I'm going to kind of go chronologically through uh, the Japanese tank development. So first up, this is the Type 89. This is a fine molds model kit. I just showed you their box for the, uh, the Ho-E there. So this was developed initially in 1929. It was based on a British design. This is, this is probably the first all Japanese tank. So this one's painted in the gray of the Japanese Navy. This would have been, well, the equivalent to like the, the Marines. And these were used through the early stages of, of World War II and throughout the war in China. So you can see this was a fun one to build. This is great fun to do. So this is the beginning of the war, basically early, early period. We start with this one, the type 89. And then we kind of move on to, you know, the, the Great Depression era and what was popular then due to lack of finances for the most part was what they called tankettes. And a lot of countries are doing things like this. So this is kind of tiny. So this is, what is this one? <laughs> this is the Type 94 TK. So this is only armed with a machine gun, crew of two. And this was used throughout World War II, but this was especially used in the war in China, where tank-to-tank -tank combat was really slim. The Chinese didn't have a lot of tanks, so these tended to be very effective there. You can see the uh, the Japanese flag marking on the turret hatch, and that was designed so that Japanese aircraft wouldn't attack their own tanks, because when you put the hatch down, you could see it from above. So that was a identification marking to make sure that they knew this was a friendly vehicle. Uh, again, a really fun model build. You know, I got a crew in there. You can see the driver a little bit. Fun paint job with these. And apparently the thought was with Japanese camouflage, you can see this bright yellow line going through the tank. The, their thought was, you, you know, you have your, your typical camouflage colors, but the yellow was supposed to help add uh, a sense of confusion. So if the enemy was trying to look at this, it wouldn't know what the front or the back was on the vehicle. Uh, it was supposed to help break up the form and make it more confusing for an enemy gunner. Whether that worked or not, I'm not sure personally i would think the yellow would stand out but but they use this scheme for most of the war so i guess it wasn't completely pointless and 
Then it kind of goes on uh, in the tankettes anyway. This is the Type 97. So this is kind of an upgraded version of the previous tankette. So now we're, we're at least adding a 37 millimeter anti-tank gun. Uh, again, this is a Japanese naval, you know, marine version. This was a fun kit, but this was a lot more work than the previous one. You can see this has the individual track links. So you have to put the treads together one by one to get the proper sag, as you can see there. See how the track sags along the wheels like it would. But this also has an entire inside to it. I don't know how good the focus is on this. But you can see the engine and the transmissions in there. There's a lot to this model. I don't recommend this one for kids. This is, this is a lot of work because the engine's there. So there's a lot of work to that kit, especially how, how small it is. So this would probably drive a kid crazy. Uh, I enjoyed it even though you know this, this took a long time to build. You can see, uh, hopefully you can see inside the compartment there. So another one by Fine Molds, so that's a Type 97. This was commonly used like for the island invasions when the Japanese were invading all the different islands in the Pacific. These were kind of effective in rolling in and adding some extra firepower on those little island hopping invasions. And then it moves on to, this is the type uh, 95 Hago. This is a very common tank throughout World War II. Again, this is a fine molds model, though other companies have come on board making this kit too. I think Dragon's now got, a, got one. Uh, I can say that the fine molds version, this one, is quite simple to build and very, very fun. I built a few of these because they just, they just go together so nicely and they're, they're just great fun. Again, with the really colorful paint schemes. This example would have served in China. So, and now we're dealing with a 37 millimeter cannon, a couple of machine guns. Look at the back machine gun. So I guess you'd have to turn the turret around if you want to use the machine gun and turn it back around if you want to use the cannon. It's kind of an odd design, but, but that's why I find the Japanese vehicles so much fun because it's such an odd looking tank. Uh, and you get the radio mast as this railing on top. That's for, that's actually for the radio antenna. And these were commonly uh, used to, everywhere the Japanese army was. And the United States came across a lots of these throughout the Pacific, battling these things. So this is a common adversary. So if you see the suspension on that, I don't know if you can see the wheels. Almost all Japanese tanks have the same similar... Uh, suspension system here as you can uh, you can see that too well but you'll notice that most of their tanks have this same design but one thing that happened with the Hago one problem with that wheel system is in China in the rice fields it, te it tended to get caught up in the ditches so they ended up doing a slightly different one you can see this is a winter one but they changed the wheels and added an extra thing here so it wouldn't get hung up in the rice paddies. So this is a particular one designed for northern China, the Manchuria area. So that's where this one would be. And you can see the uh, commanders wearing very heavy winter clothing because this is way up uh, near like the Russian border. So and eventually when the Russians attacked, you know, they came across these. So the initial design with the Japanese tanks, uh, when they were invading China, the, their goal was to move into Russia. And they did try to do that in the summer of 1939. They decided to try to push into like the Mongolia area, into, into the Russian Siberia, that, that section there. And they had a number of tank clashes, and that's when they discovered to their horror that these tanks just were, were no match for the Russian tanks of the period, and they took a heavy beating. So that kind of changed the entire strategy for the Japanese, because they decided maybe going to Russia is a bad idea. Uh, apparently Hitler didn't get this in his head <laughs> a few years later, because he decided to go into Russia, and that didn't go well for him either. Uh, so anyway, so this is another version of the Type 95 Hago. 
And that brings us to the main battle tank of the period, which you're going to see similar design ideas. So this is the type 97 Chiha. So this was the basic tank throughout World War II. You can see it's got the same uh, like clothesline style um, radio antenna. It's got a similar design where it's got you know a 57 millimeter gun here which was actually a low velocity gun. This was kind of designed more for fighting infantry, taking out like pillboxes, machine gun nests. This is supposed to be an infantry support tank. This wasn't particularly good at tank versus tank fighting. The Hago was supposed to handle that job, but mm, didn't do terribly well. And this one, by 1942, they realized, you know, they're going to have to upgun these things with stronger cannon, which they did. They invented an improved version. So you can see the machine gun in the front, and again, the machine gun at the back of the turret. So again, this commander would have to turn the turret around if he wanted to use the machine gun, and then turn it back around if he wanted to use the cannon. Interesting concept. Some uh, early Russian tanks had that concept as well, so it's not completely novel to the Japanese, but the Japanese definitely stayed with it longer. Uh, so this is in the markings. I believe this one was in the Battle of... Uh, I think this is Pelelu. It was a big tank fight there with the United States, you know, had a nasty battle with these things, but apparently this unit got wiped out by the Americans. So, but that's the Type 97 Chiha. These were used very effectively in the Japanese invasion of Malaya, the Malaysia area through Singapore, where they actually managed to get these things to move through the jungle, which the British figured nobody can drive tanks through the jungle. Well, Japan did. <laughs> much to everybody's surprise. So, they had their moment. That moves us to... This is the Type 1 Chihi, which is basically an improved version of the Chiha. This has the improved turret, which was used on the Chiha later models, which has a 47 millimeter anti-tank gun, and this gun was lethal. This could damage American tanks and Russian tanks. This had enough firepower to be a threat, a real threat. So the Americans made sure to target these if they saw them because this, you know, could rip apart a Sherman tank that the Americans, you know, at certain ranges. So the Chi He, the difference now, I don't know if you can see that there, is that it's got cleaner lines to it in that this was a welded design for the most part. The turret still, you can still see that, that the turret is riveted together, which is what the case was in all of the earlier tanks. But now we're getting into welding technology, and you're seeing that they're more, you know, angled and straight plates with welding seams. Uh, the Japanese simplified their camouflage scheme at this point. And uh, it's got radio, different types of radios now, later period radios. Again, same suspension that we've seen on the other tanks. Uh, but most of this type of tank, the Chi He, the, which was designed around 1941-ish, but didn't really get into production until like late, you know, 44, 45. So most of these ended up being in Japan itself, preparing for the home invasion, which they expected to happen around 45, 46, but never happened. Uh, because the atom bomb kind of ended the war a lot quicker. You know, however you feel about that. So anyway, this is the, uh, the Type 1 here. And then... We move on to the Type 3. This is the Chinu. So this came about on the, well, on the drawing board anyway, in 1943. And this didn't see action. It may not have seen any action. It, it's debatable whether any of these are involved in the Battle of Okinawa. But these were, for the most part, again, stationed in Japan itself, waiting for the 
what they thought was the inevitable invasion of the Japanese home islands. So this is a welded design. Again, it's based on the uh, the chassis and design of the original Chiha, from, which dated back to 1937. Same suspension, but it's got the welded design of the later uh, Chi He, the Type 1. So this has got a much bigger turret, and we're now mounting a 75 millimeter field gun, and this had a good anti-tank capability. So now the Japanese have caught up at this point to try to come up with some good anti-tank, tank versus tank fighting machines. Although at this point it's kind of late in the war and they didn't really get too many of these built. There was enough for a division, which was stationed, like I said, in Japan waiting for the American invasion. But this is actually a pretty decent design with a good gun, but they didn't see any combat. So that's the uh, Chinu. And there were a couple of different variations of this that were experimented with. This was kind of the main production version. And they did try to move on to some heavy tank designs, but there were only a handful of those experiments that, that got into use, but some of those are really quite big and quite crazy looking. Um, anyway, so here's the, the Chinu. And the Japanese did design a number of different anti-tank gun platforms like mobile artillery and, and this is one it kind of looks like a tank but it's really a mobile howitzer and this has a 75 millimeter gun which is really designed as infantry support kind of a nice looking vehicle again based on the type 1 chi he design and this would have been in Japan also waiting for the the main invasion. So, so that would have been very late in the war, around 45, yeah, when this thing was coming around. And they had a few other designs, uh, some of which were like open topped, uh, like a tank chassis with a shield on the front, and then different types of guns for different anti tank or mobile artillery purposes. Uh, and one of which you can actually see. Well, once this pandemic is over and museums reopen, there is a great museum in on the border of Hudson and Stowe, Massachusetts, which is the American Heritage Museum, which is a new tank museum, which is pretty amazing. And they do have one captured Japanese self-propelled gun there, which is really cool to look at. They also have lots and lots of tanks and armored vehicles. It's an amazing museum. Uh, you should, could look that up. It's the American Heritage Museum, and it's right up 495 in Massachusetts, maybe about an hour away. But if you're really interested in looking at tanks up close and personal, uh, it's incredible what their collection is. And from German, Russian, there's everything in there. It's it's a, it's amazing museum, and I'm not a paid spokesperson for them, but I've been there, and it, it's mind-boggling what's there, considering it's so close. And once a year, all things, if providing everything goes well with the pandemic and whatnot, they tend to have a giant uh, battle that you can watch on their, on their grounds where they have the tanks come out with infantry and you can watch a battle, which is insane. <laughs> but you can sit and watch these things in action. You know, they're all firing blanks and stuff and they give you earplugs, thank goodness. But it, it's amazing to see that. Anyhow, so this is a very brief discussion on, you know, Japanese tanks of the World War II period, which I built a number of because I find it to be a fascinating subject. Uh, I don't know if this was helpful or not. Uh, I don't know if it was even interesting. <laughs> but hey, I'm just, you know, coming up with videos and things that hopefully you guys are enjoying. And if you're interested in reference books on this topic, as always, as a librarian, I'm going to promote the books. There is a series, which I did have to track these down, which is in English and Polish. But there's a whole series of these on different tanks. This is the early war and on the car period. But it's got some interesting photographs. You know, here's the one with that uh, air recognition symbol that I showed you the model of. And this gives you all kinds of data, photos, information. 
and if I can find it. And then for model builders, you know, different color profiles, which is always neat to look at. So if you're looking for the for books on this topic, I mean, you're gonna have to source these on the internet, like I had to do, but they do make them. So, hope you found that fun. But uh, just going a little further with my hobby and some of the collections and things that I've got here at my house. Okay, uh, hope to see you guys real soon, and stay safe, everybody, okay? Bye.